Does that look familiar to anybody? Can y'all hear me as this thing on? Oh, I lost my clip, Jeremy. This is all my... This is all the things I carry around with me every, everywhere I go. This is all my stuff. I'm bound to it, as if bound by chains. It dogs my every step. I've got things in here, you know, mortgages and car payments and I've got addictions and bad habits and I've got unresolved issues and I just got a lot of stuff that blocks me from fulfilling the role, the the path that Jesus had for me, but I got all this stuff and I just hang on to it and I don't know what to do with, do with it and it weighs me down and it will drag us down and it will, it will cast us down. Y'all know I like the 23rd Psalm and, um, and uh, I read part of this book by an author named Philip Keller when I was preparing this message. And we can just learn a lot from animals. You know, you look at animals and humans really are like sheep. We're stubborn and dumb and... <laughs> stubborn and dumb. <laughs> and, uh, and I read this book and there's a part where he talks about uh, when sheep get too too much hair, too, too much wool on them, that it makes them easier to be cast down. And a cast sheep is one that has either laid down or fallen over, but it's on its back. And it's real, you know, it's a fat sheep, so it's like this. Meh, meh, it can't, it's so fat it can't roll over, it's got too much hair. And it's done for. Like, it's over. This cast sheep is easy prey. There's wolves and whatever else wants to, wants to kill and eat that thing. And while it's on its back, what's it going to do? It's helpless. Uh, only if that sheep has a really good shepherd does it really have much of a chance. Because a good shepherd, like it says in the Bible, Jesus is a good shepherd. If he's missing one sheep, won't he just run out to find it? And a good shepherd would find his sheep and restore it right side up. And um, that's what we need. That's what our nation needs. That's what the world needs. After I got saved, you know, I was working at Oak Grove Pharmacy and God had a good plan for me. I mean, here I was, a confused individual who for the first 28 years of his life I found relief in drugs and alcohol, and I was a complete shame to my parents. But God intervened in my life, and He stopped me from that life of self-destruction, and He put me on a better path. And that path, um, I didn't realize it would take me to Oak Grove Pharmacy. And Bruce and Vicki Moyer were the owners of that store then. And, um, you know, one day Bruce invited me to go to church, and I heard a message that blew my mind. <laughs> so I went back next Sunday and got saved. But then after that, Bruce and Vicki, they discipled me after that. I don't know if they intentionally did it, but they, if you've ever been in their house, they have these two giant book stands on each side of their chimney, and uh, they just supplied me with an... <laughs> <laughs> Vicky would give me so many books, I'd be like, ah, I hadn't finished the first one, you know. 
Anyways, I'm real grateful for Bruce and Vicki for doing that. But this one book, it was The Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, and he talked about a cast sheep and what a good shepherd would do. It would restore that sheep. And, and uh, Vicki also used to like to listen to like gospel music. She loved bluegrass music. She, she, uh, I guess she still does. I mean, uh, but black gospel music, she liked it. And, and I love that music. And the song that's been going through my head as I prepared this sermon is Jesus is the answer for the world today. And y'all just have to forgive me, but it goes like, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other, because Jesus is the way. Now y'all know why I don't sing in the choir. But man, Jesus is the answer for the world today. And, and I see people walking around like this, and it's just like, it drives me crazy. I'm like, come to Jesus, please. Please meet Jesus. He's, he is my good friend, and he has shown me a better way. And uh, I'm not saying I don't have this, because I've got this, and there's still some things that he is plucking out of my life. But I am confident that he'll keep doing it until the day of Christ, right? So, that's our problem. That's, that's our condition. And Jesus is our answer. And that was my introduction. The focal text tonight, if you will turn to John chapter 9. This is an amazing story here. I, I recently, I get on BibleGateway.com and uh, I, I like to go on there. It has a bunch of reading plans and, and uh, this one it had was read the Bible. It was a challenge. Read the Bible in 90 days. So I took it and, uh, you know, I did it in 88 days and, uh, and that's about all I did when, every night when I got home, you know, it's because it was like 12 pages a day. And so you're just crunching through all this Bible. But, man, I, there's two things that occurred from reading the Bible in 88 days. One, I, I fell deeper in love with God and His Word. And two, I realized that I need to read the Bible a whole lot more. And that is it. It's, it's so precious. It's, it's God's Word. It's God-breathed. It's, people have died for this, and people are dying for it right now. And, I've got like four or five of these around my house, and there are places in the world where if they just had a page of this, they would treasure it. They would, they would hide it. They would risk their very lives for it. I th we probably all need to read our Bible more, huh? All right, but this story, I went through uh, John 9, and this one story just stuck out to me. And by, by the time I, when I was reading this, Charlie had asked me to consider, you know, doing some kind of sermon. And I'm not a preacher, and I've never been to seminary, so sorry. <laughs> I just apologize on the front end for you. But this story stuck out to me. And this is, Jesus was passing by, and he saw a blind man from birth. And what stuck out to me is, the way he healed this blind man, you know, he goes up to him and he spits in the dirt. He makes some mud, spreads it all over the guy's eyes, and then says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. It's like, you know, if you went to an eye doctor today or, or if you went to a doctor today, you're like, doctor, I, got, I can't see out of this eye or, or just any kind of eye condition and he just said, oh, yeah. Come here. <laughs> yeah, we're going to fix you up here. Hold on, hold on. Be, be still. All right. Now go on down there in the Arkansas River and wash that off. You be just right, boy. <laughs> and before you leave, make sure and give your receptionist your insurance card. <laughs> Pay your copay. I'm not doing charge counts. 
<laughs> Golly, you'd be like, D Doc, whoa, whoa, bud, whoa, you just spit on the ground, and you're going to put that on my eye. Like, that's not going to improve my eyesight. You know, any, any pharmaceutical preparation for the eye has to be made sterile because if it's not, you just put bacteria in your eye and you got another problem on top of whatever you had before. So, in thinking about this talk tonight and this uh, Bible passage, at first I was like, oh, I'm going to talk about Jesus. You know, and, and right off the bat, as he was passing by, he saw a blind man from birth and thanks to, you know, some other commentaries and, and this uh, Bible that the deacons gave me, uh, I got some insight into that he saw a blind man. He didn't just see him and was like, oh, there's a blind man. Well, disciples, let's get some lunch. I'm hungry. <laughs> he saw the blind man. He took note of him. Like, he, he noticed him. He was, he looked at him. He saw his condition. He realized you know, probably way more than any of us would. He, he, he looked upon this man because he cares. Because Jesus cares about us. And he sees every one of us. And he sees all of our stuff that we drag around. And uh, he is completely capable of restoring us. He's completely capable of redeeming us. That's what he does. He is the God of restoration. He is, a, he is a redeeming God. And I'm thankful for it because I needed a lot of redemption and a lot of restoration. So as I thought more and more about the topic tonight and this story, I realized that a lot of people, they may know, okay, yeah, Jesus is the answer, but Maybe they're not ready to make that, that jump, you know. Coming to Jesus, you know, we put a lot of things in front of that. We don't need to. I mean, little children get it a lot better than a lot of adults do. I mean, Hannah Thompson just got baptized today, and that took a lot of courage. I got baptized when I was 30 years old, and I can tell you, like, that, that took a lot of courage. You know, sometimes we get too smart for our own good. We overthink things. And uh, we need to learn to just trust Jesus, don't we? And that's the first point in here. This blind man, let me just read this for you. As he was passing by, Jesus, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples questioned him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Yeah. <laughs> They just didn't get it, did they? And Jesus was like, neither this man nor his parents sinned. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After he said these things, he spit on the ground, made some mud from the saliva, spread it on his eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. So he left, washed, and he came back seeing. <laughs> it's a miracle. Jesus could have just said, you're healed. He could have just thought it, and the guy would have been healed. But, but this guy, this came about so that God's work might be displayed in him. Maybe it came about just so that preachers from here on could have this to talk about in a sermon. I, I don't know. But the first thing that the blind man had to do was to trust Jesus. Then he had to obey Jesus. After he trusted and obeyed him, he came worshiping Jesus. And that's our points tonight. Trust, obey, and worship. Recently, I watched this uh, show on Netflix, and it was called Documentary. It was a documentary about ducks, hence the name Documentary. And I was in there watching it, and Jennifer was kind of on the laptop, like, you know, and I was just cackling and just like, I, I loved it. I've watched it like two or three times now. I left it playing when I left home just now so that Sonny, our dog, could watch it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's awesome. Ducks are beautiful, you know, and it, it starts out. 
it has a close up of like all these duck eggs and there's this duck down feather around them you know the mama duck makes it to keep them warm and then um, it kind of you know comes out comes out it, it shows a wood duck flying into this hollow in this tree and it plops down in the hollow and then there's those duck eggs and the mama ducks in there and it says that the, uh, the little ducks they recognize the mama's voice because as she uh, stayed on them and kept them warm. She cooed to them with her voice. And uh, it, as I was doing this, and I thought about it today, I was like, man, all this is sounding real familiar. They recognized her voice. On day two, the second day that the ducks are alive, the mama's out in a pond somewhere, and she's just, you know, making the duck noises. Cow, 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 cow. And uh, however they sound, cow, cow. And the little ducks, they're like, you know, beep, 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 beep. You know, they're instantly responding because they recognize the sound of their mama. And they climb out, you know, this shows the first duck and it climbs out of the, at the little opening of the holler. And then the camera goes way back and down. And you realize that this tree, it is at the top, the narrator says, a 70 foot tree. And this little duck just. It's standing right at the edge of it, looking down. It's got these little giblet arms. They don't do anything yet. <laughs> and the mama's, cow, cow. And they're all in there peeping. And then the duck, it just jumps. I mean, it just leaps right off that thing. Couldn't we learn something from that? If any of us haven't come to Jesus and we're afraid, faith is the answer. Sometimes we don't want to hear that, well, you just got to have faith. I can't believe everything in the Bible because I don't know about it. Just have faith. But it's like that. You know, what am I going to have to give up? This is what you have to give up. You know, it's like, Jesus or... No, Jesus or... Rusty chain, Jesus. Man, that little baby duck, it jumped right out of that tree. And it shows it all the way flying down. And it hits the ground. And then it just bounces off the ground because it weighs about an ounce. And the other ducks just follow right up suit. I mean, they're just like, bam, bam. And they flap their little arms on the way down. <laughs> it doesn't fly. It just hits the ground. And they bounce off the ground and they're still kicking their legs. And then they get right side up and they waddle out. And their mom's still calling them. She's telling them, okay, now come to the pool. You know, co come out here to the pond. And they obey their mama and they do it. That's, that's wonderful. I mean, that's as simple as it is. Like, me and Jennifer in Sunday school with the first and second graders, they just get that. They're, they're not worried about, like, they don't, they don't, they're not concerned with their, their intellect or, or worldly lies, you know, that, that have been told. They just believe it. They're like, yes, Jesus died for my sins. He loves me. <coughs> Bam, that's it. Have you, ever, have you ever ran across a dog that had trust issues? Like little Sonny, I can, she can be sleeping on the couch. I can get right up in her face rub my head on her, just mess with her, I can aggravate her. You wouldn't do that to a dog with trust issues. You would not do that. That dog would bite your face off. You know, if you, if you just, even a dog that just doesn't know you, if, if you found one of these dogs that runs up and down the road here, if you cornered that dog and tried to, hey, lovey-dovey, it would snap your face. I just remembered, I, my dog, Cato, I had him in the, I had this Ford Bronco, and I went to my dad's pharmacy. This is back when I was in college, and uh, he, he would ride around with me. He was this lab mutt dog. I think he had pit in him, he, he, he was kind of a little crazy, so I think that's where the pit came from. But one time I came to the pharmacy, and um, I was about to walk out of the door because I was going back to my truck, and I saw like the shopping center security guard talking to my dog, and I was like, oh gosh. And it, and, you know, just as I was going to be like, hey, don't do that, I see him go like this. 
hey, hey. and I see my dog, pow, and I'm like, oh, gosh, and the guy backs up, oh, oh. he kind of just gets out of there, I was like, golly, you don't, a dog with trust issues, they're just not that fun to be around, are they, you know, what do you, I mean, what, what good are they? If they have trust issues, you can't have anybody around them, what good are they? Hey, Jeremy, you remember that time Blanche Santoro called down the drugstore? And she said, hey, Jeremy, do you speak of the Italian? Jeremy said, no. Well, what good are you? <laughs> I don't even think she wanted anything. I think that's, that was it. She hung up. Oh, was Jared... <laughs> So that's it. We need to trust Jesus. This blind man, he had to trust that this Jesus who was making mud with spit and dirt and putting it on his eyes knew what he was doing. Second, we have to obey Jesus. Jesus told this man, now go wash in the pool of Siloam. I was talking with Eddie this morning, Eddie Duke, about this message. And he said, yeah, if that guy had gone and washed in the pool of Bethsaida, he probably wouldn't have been healed. Well, that's right, because he wouldn't have obeyed Jesus, right? He said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. It's just that simple. And, um, boy, if there's ever anything that gets in the way of obedience... You know, sometimes when I write my tithe checks, it hurts a little bit. And I, uh, but I want a new motorcycle, and um, that's not going to happen because, you know, Jennifer, she let me have that. <laughs> but I would like to, you know, there's, there's things I want. For, you know, I want a new rifle, and, uh, you know, right now I've got a mortgage, and, you know, sometimes it hurts me more to write that tide check because of decisions that I have made. You know, when I pile on all this stuff, all the things that I wanted, then I can't, I can't give the way that I want to. And, and I like to give. Like it, when you're obeying God, it just... I'm not doing it for a feeling, it's for obedience, but man, it feels good to, to obey. You know, when I obeyed my mom and dad growing up, boy, it paid off, you know, I didn't get grounded or the belt. Sometimes, you know, when I was growing up, and I got saved when I was 30 years old, but some adult at some point in my life told me, well, Terry, you don't have to go to church to get... You don't have to go to church to get into heaven. Man, I rode on that for a long time. They just... Those Baptists, and they think, you know... You don't have to go to church to get into heaven. I just told myself that. You know, what, what good did that do me? <laughs> it didn't do me any good. And, and I don't think that it says verbatim in the Bible... Thou dost not have to attend church to get into heaven. To be saved, you've got to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and He died for your sins. But He demands that you worship Him. And the first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Um, in obedience, it, it just kind of demands demands things. It demands my time and, and if I am truly worshiping God why wouldn't I want to come to church? If y'all I was a wreck. I was a wreck. My life was in shambles. I mean I, I was so low that I was having to lower my standards to feel better about myself. I was hanging around people that at one point I would look down on. And there I was right in the midst of them. And you know what? I realized a valuable lesson right then that I'm no better than anybody else. And no matter where I'm at in place in life, 
I can, I can go way down. But with Jesus, I don't have to. I, I've, got, I've got a way out with Jesus. Obedience. You got to obey your parents. They don't tell you stuff. I guess I'll look over here now. You got to obey your parents. Why did God give us the Ten Commandments? You know, what if we didn't have the Ten Commandments? What would this nation look like? Everything good in nations, every good law, it came from the Bible. And everything that God told us to do, it was for our own good. And um, what if Jesus didn't obey the Father? I mean, would that have happened? That was tough. Coming to church on Sundays is not tough. Getting here on Sunday nights is not tough. It's just not. So, in our story, let's get back there. I'm getting off track. It goes through the... They brought him to the Pharisees. You know, how did this happen? The Pharisees said, he did work on the Sabbath. Well, he's not from God. Blah, 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 blah. You know, they're just, they're just way off. It's funny that Jesus was healing a blind man, and the Pharisees were so blind that they couldn't even see a miracle right in front of their eyes. What a... That's not what I was going to talk about either. I'm getting off track. Uh, so, he tells him over and over, The man called Jesus, put mud on my eyes, told me to go to the asylum and wash off, and I did, and I can see. And this guy was probably just like, you know, I can see, I can see. I mean, how did y'all feel when you first came to Jesus? I mean, I was freaking out. I was, I was telling everybody. I guess I still am. I mean, it completely changed my life. <laughs> And it's been all good. So uh, some of the Pharisees said, you know, Jesus isn't from, from God. He, he wouldn't have done that on the Sabbath. Others said, well, how can a sinful man perform such signs? So they were divided. They kept asking the blind man, well, who do you think this guy is? And the blind man said, I don't know, a prophet? They still didn't believe that he had been born blind or that this had happened. So they brought his parents. And his parents were like, yeah, this is our son. He was born blind. And they're like, well, how did it happen? They're like, look, I don't know. You better ask him. They didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. You know, they weren't going to start proclaiming Jesus. They were afraid of the Pharisees. But the blind man who had been had his sight restored, he still, he still told the truth. That Jesus healed him. At the end of it, they said they ridiculed him. You're that man's disciple, but we're Moses' disciple. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but this man, we don't know where he's from. And then the guy who had said at the, you know, out there begging all of his life, he just says, that's an amazing thing. You don't know where he's from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but if anyone is God-fearing and does his will, he listens to him. Throughout history, no one has ever heard of someone opening the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. That just made the Pharisees really mad. And they were like, you who were born entirely in sin, are you trying to teach us? So they kicked him out. And that was it. You know, good thing Jesus healed him, but he got kicked out of the synagogue. And so, you know... It doesn't end there. Jesus comes up to him, the guy who had been cast out. Because he's the good shepherd. And he asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? The guy says, who is he that I may believe in him? Jesus said, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. He says, I believe, Lord. And he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. It's the only appropriate response for what Jesus has done for us. It's, it's the only response. Jesus laid down his life 
for us, we, our sin, put him on the cross. He did it willingly. And we should worship him in spirit and truth, right? Heartfelt worship. Not just, well, I went to Sunday, I checked that off, and now it's football time. Jesus is the good shepherd. He is, um, he's mighty to save. He's, he's a mighty God. He's the wonderful counselor. He's the prince of peace. He's the everlasting father. He is the good shepherd. He, he lays down his life for the sheep. They know his voice, and they hear him, and they follow him. Is Jesus talking to you? Have, do you hear him? Does he, does he, like, tug at your heart? When you hear his name, do you think, oh, man, I know I should follow him? Well, do it. Why would you wait? You don't know if you've got tomorrow. I think I'm done there. My challenge to the church tonight, if you're not saved, if you don't know Jesus like I know Jesus, I would beg that you would consider him. What you have to do is so simple, and we make it so complex and complicated. Like, Jesus is the one who died on the cross. He's the one who extends grace for you to come to him. All you have to do is accept a gift. And if you are already saved, but you found yourself like this, on your back like that lamb, meh, I like the sound noises. All you got to do is, is ask him. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It doesn't mean that what's being carried isn't hard and heavy. It just means that Jesus is going to do most of the work for you. If you take up on his yoke, he'll do all the work for you. He's gentle and humble. He's a gentleman. Isn't it great that we serve a God that doesn't just grab us and say, Worship me. Can you imagine serving someone like that? He says, come to me. I'm gentle and humble. That's the kind of shepherd I want. I don't want a shepherd that's just going to come out there and beat me into submission. I want the shepherd who's going to love me. And I will know that he loves me because he cares for me every day. And if every one of y'all think about your entire life, just the fact that we're all right now sitting in here alive is a miracle. If you think about all the things that happen every day, if you've driven up and down this highway, it's a miracle that we're alive today. Jesus has watched after you from day one. He created you to worship him. And when we don't do that, we don't look so hot. Jennifer broke out this trumpet not too long ago when Joel did that in his own words, which was awesome. And I still listen to it in my car sometimes. I wore them out at the pharmacy with it. You know, it's like the 80th time I played in his own words. <laughs> in his own words up there. But I remember Jennifer broke out this trumpet and um, it wasn't really in tune, you know, and she maybe she wasn't quite in tune with it. But she was like... When we don't worship God with all of our heart, we're like a, we're like a, just an out-of-tune instrument. There's a prayer of St. Francis, and the first line says, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. And the rest of it goes on, so that I can do what you want me to do the way you want me to do it. Back to my challenge. There's a verse in the Bible that right after I got saved, I heard it. And it was one of those verses that I just like latched on to because I was like, wow, that's, that's exactly what happened to me. And if you will go 
I probably don't have to because you know it. 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's absolutely amazing what this says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Jesus makes all things new. And, and I'm a living testimony to that. Jennifer, she knew me before I was saved. And she knows me now that I have been saved. And she can tell you I'm not the same person. I can recognize that in myself. I was not a good friend. I was a taker in life, never a giver. I wanted what was right for me. I was the center of my universe. Completely selfish. But I thought I was a good guy. After I got saved, I heard that verse. All things become new if you're in Christ and it's beautiful well later on when I was reading the Bible I, I, you know, I finished reading that part and it's a little bit deeper than just I get to be a new person it says everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, as he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So you're in Christ. You're a new, crea you're a new creation. You've been made new. That's awesome. Guess what? <laughs> it's time to act like it. We're ambassadors for Christ. And in everything we do, we need to acknowledge him. I was thinking about my neighbors around my house where I live. I've introduced myself or been introduced. I've met just about all of them. Never talked about Jesus. Don't know if they go to church or not. And I'm not saying that tonight I'm going to go over there and knock on the door and say, Hey, if you die tonight, do you know where you go? But Charlie's been using this buzzword lately called intentional. And so I thought, you know, if I did want to breach that subject with my neighbors, how could I do that? And so I started thinking, like, as a church... Why don't we start thinking about our neighbors like that? Me and Jennifer pass a guy every Sunday morning, usually. He's on his front porch smoking. And they think, well, you know, what's he doing? I don't know. Do we care? Do we care if he goes to hell or not? I mean, is that what it boils down to? Hey, bud, we're going to church. You can go to hell. <laughs> I'm going to church. Wouldn't I be compelled if I'm an ambassador for Christ who has reconciled me to God? He, he initiated this conversation. He, he did everything. All I did was take a gift and say, thank you. And he wants me to tell people about it. And he wants y'all to tell people about it. You know, I don't know if it's going to be our neighbor that we don't know what they do or where they're going when they die. Or I don't know if maybe as a church we should call some people that we're not seeing in church lately and be like, hey man, are you okay? Let's do that. If y'all know someone that hadn't been coming to church, I'm on, I challenge y'all. Let's call them and say, brother, we love you. and We miss seeing you. Anybody willing to take that challenge? Right on. Is anybody willing to talk to their neighbor? And you, so maybe we have to get creative about it. You know, maybe let's just start mowing our neighbor's yard. And he's like, what are you doing? I saw that in a movie. I thought that would work. You know, you just start mowing his yard. Brother, I'm just mowing your yard because I love you. And so does Jesus. He would be like, this guy has flipped his lid. But after you mowed the yard all summer long, he'd be like, man, man. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he'd be like, well, if I love Jesus, does that mean I've got to mow someone's yard? I don't know. 
My point is, let's tell someone about Jesus. I mean, even if we see a guy somewhere and he's begging for money on the side of the freeway, you can just tell him that Jesus loves him. Because he does. And he loves all of us. I think that's about all I got, Charlie. Um, thank you all for letting me share this with you. I don't know if you all learned much tonight, but any time that I teach a lesson, I know it always blesses me because it makes me dig deeper in this right here. And I learn just a little bit more about my God and my Creator. And that can never be bad.